Welcome to the Five Phenomenon Podcast. I am your host, Shane Hazen, and with me again this week is Lonnie Gonzalez. Hi, Shane. Nice to hey. be here. You know what's funny is last week I said uh, your last name with a question mark, like I was Ron <laughs> Burgundy, and it was basically because I've known you since before you were married, and I didn't know if I needed to include your maiden name on top of it or not. Yeah, that's I, funny. I'm Ron Burgundy. Um, <laughs> The other thing I forgot to mention last week was that um, part of the inspiration of doing the rando movie picks came from, uh, we called it movie club, but we, we, we started a few years ago when I was still in Austin, something similar to a book club, but knowing that we were much higher level of film <laughs> fanatics, uh, we wanted to pick movies that we thought other people who were knowledgeable about that film, hadn't seen, and favorites that we thought others hadn't seen. And that kind of became the basis on the rando picks that I, we've been having on the podcast the last few weeks. That's funny. Yeah, uh, thinking about that, I uh, I thought it was, maybe it um, kind of reveals how we picked, like last week I picked one of my favorites in a movie that I liked and wanted to share. And this week you picked some weird, you know, critical essay, <laughs> like esoteric uh, topic. And I'm like, but I just want to watch a movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was my, it was my, you were the per guinea pig I was picking on this uh, expansion idea of this movie podcast. Let's not talk about a movie perhaps, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it, whenever my picks always went over, I don't know, was it, <laughs> did I have a single pick that went over well? I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe other people like, you know, Margaret, I know a lot of other Margaret people. Margaret was the Margaret. first big one. <laughs> Margaret was the first big one I picked. It was the director's cut of Margaret because everyone's only seen the normal version or no one seen even the theatrical and after that there was promptly the rule of no more movies over two hours and 30 minutes <laughs> and i th think like and th my problem was i'd always pick movies that i thought you guys hadn't seen and was were interesting and sometimes there were movies that i have fond memories of and would rewatch and be like you'd feel the room go cold showing it <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, but then there were a few movies where it was just stuff I've been meaning to watch forever mm -hmm. and I didn't want to have to watch it by myself. So we watched, we watched, uh, some first movies from some big filmmakers like Michael Mann yeah, and Edgar uh, Wright that no one's seen. Like we watched, we watched, uh, what, what's it? Uh, A Fistful of Fingers oh, yeah. and Jericho, Mi and Jericho Mile, the, both these yeah. really hard things like we were watching off YouTube and yeah. Those were hit or misses, though. The the, the the A lot of my picks were more misses. And yours, I thought, for the most part, were always satisfying hits for the most part. Well, that, that makes me feel good. But yeah, like I said, I was choosing a lot of movies that I personally like that I thought maybe a lot of people hadn't seen, like um, Barcelona, directed by Witt Stillman, or Mississippi mm. Masala. Uh, Mira that was Mira. a good one. I hadn't seen that. Yeah. That was, that was a really good one. Um, and was... Funny, also a few weeks into the club, you you asked for the moratorium also on New York based movies too, which yeah. <laughs> well, I think we had had a, a run where just the, there were many we had had you know watched several movies, and I was the only one that had picked a movie that didn't take place in New York, and we're talking movies from different decades, different directors, but it was all <laughs> you know New York. <laughs> I think like, it hit. <laughs> it hit after my picked uh, Peter Bogdanovich's "They All Laughed," which <laughs> Bogdan. Yeah, this um, this also goes to my pick for what we're going to talk about today, uh, which is um, illustrative of my. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, uh, is there a term for people who love New York? <laughs> 
I don't know. Apparently it's people that I choose to spend time with. <laughs> My husband is one of them. <laughs> Sinatrophilia. Um, the, yeah. Well, it's not just New York, but the publishing circles. And um, mm. since most of, most of the literary world comes out of, American literary world comes out of New York, today's uh, pick is a piece of film criticism by probably, I think it's not really even um, a, uh, a contest. My favorite film critic, Pauline Kael, and a lot of people's favorite film critics, and a lot of people's, how would you say, not dislike, most disliked film critic, but I, I think you have this reaction where you just like, you run to these people who are fanatic about, fanatical about Pauline Kael, mm -hmm. and you're just like, oh, that's nice. I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, maybe to, you could say she's divisive, certainly, <laughs> is one way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she... Yeah, <laughs> I yeah I uh, admitted to you I don't really respond I think in the same way to her writing although I can um, I ex respect that she is a talented writer and mm -hmm. she's certainly passionate about films and you know not afraid to express opinions that are contrarian um, which is always you know a welcome thing you don't want everyone to have the same opinion but just in the writing that I've read I'm not responding to her um, as enthusiastically as others <laughs> yeah I mean we, we'll talk about this a little more later but part of the the appeal of Pauline Kael isn't necessarily her opinions and there's a lot of times especially with current film criticism the group think I'm always having a problem with the group think the Rotten Tomatoesation of mm, yeah. and consensus making and in and it's not even that she was really had a different like or dislike opinion. It was just that she would always come at it from a different angle. But today's pick is what I think is the most sustained piece of uh, work she did. It's probably the longest published piece she did, single piece. And that's her very controversial essay on Citizen Kane, Raising Kane. So this was published first as a two-part. It was mainly inspired. Um, uh, it was supposed to be an introduction to the Citizen Kane book, which was um, was the I want to say the first publication of the screenplay, and it then ended up being published in two parts in the New Yorker before the book came out. Part of the reason I thought it'd be interesting to talk about is David Fincher's upcoming movie Mank, which, according to producer Eric Roth, is supposed to come out next month, maybe. Uh, might be based very much on this essay. It's uh, Fincher's movie is written by mm. his father, Jack, who wrote it. I want to say it was supposed to be his follow up to seven. Like it was supposed to be before Fight Club, but he really wanted to shoot it in black and white and no one would let him shoot it. That mm. format until Netflix is more like we need content. And <laughs> it's it's weird because I, I think there's a co-writer on the movie now, but Fincher's dad died in 2003. and and um. According to this article I looked at on the Orson Welles site, yeah, it's supposed to be um, strongly based on Raising Cain. I mean, the essay itself is predominantly trying to research, it comes from 1971, is trying to research the career of screenwriter, forgotten screenwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz, who is brother of Joseph Mankiewicz, who's more known for All About Eve and Barefoot Contessa. So, uh, yeah, Anis, what did you <laughs> think of the essay? Yeah, uh, you know, I had a tough time with this essay because, as you said, it is very long. And um, and when I was first reading it, I, you know, congratulated myself for getting to the end. And then I saw a note at the bottom that said, uh, this is part one of a part two part essay. <laughs> and I yeah. Just it, uh, burst out laughing because I thought, oh yeah. God, there's more. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which is always a great, <laughs> great, just, yeah. They should blur but, uh, that on the back. Yeah. Yes, right. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I guess I, like I said, I didn't uh, totally respond to it. I, there were certainly things in it that I, uh, you know, could, uh, were interesting or some points you made that I could agree with or at least, you know, think about. But it, as a uh, piece, I was struggling to find what the, the thesis was and, she seemed to sort of ramble through. It was almost like just rambling through different 
thoughts that she was having and it would kind of circle back yeah. and, and you know we had a part one and then part two she's all of a sudden talking about things that she talked about in part one again and it's, it it's seemed like it hadn't been edited <laughs> It's definitely tricky because Kale never wrote anything this long. And even and even she at the New Yorker, she had no uh, word limit or space limit. And she would take advantage of that. But she like her stuff is very unstructured. And like it, it's weird because like, did you find it readable, though? Like even when you were kind of having trouble with the the thought process and the logic that she was arguing, you like because because um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Because Kale fans constantly point out that between like the like liveliness and the pop of her of her um st the of her style and her ability to come up with she's she can be really insightful or she can be kind of gossipy and catty or she can go to places of judgment and observation that other people won't, which to be fair is very often unfair especially she she was very noted for writing about actors looks in a way that yeah yeah i did notice that she could, <laughs> could notice that in some other reviews too <laughs> you could see an actor like she she had some interactions with the actors later and the actor would just like put on a brave face to say that yes i guess my nose is emblematic of you know <laughs> Of the Midwestern values that my performance espoused, you know, <laughs> like a fake quote. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's one of the things I think that kind of turns me off when I'm reading it is sort of the when she does kind of veer into that sourness or things that are, I think, unnecessarily cruel or maybe don't really have any bearing on the on the movie that we're watching. You know, I read a review that she wrote about. Um, the movie The Singing Nun, which isn't a great movie, but you didn't also have to say that Debbie Reynolds wasn't looking too great either. <laughs> you know? Is that well, okay? Let me ask you: Is that exactly how she phrased it? Um, she said that she was uh, looking blousy and bleary-eyed, I believe. <laughs> that <laughs> and magic. kind of unfavorably comparing her to uh, The Sound of Music, Julie Andrews, being you know kind of bright-eyed young well, thing and... funny she mentioned sound <laughs> of music let's get a real quick biography of kale because she was very famously or there's some argument about whether this happened or not but she was fired from mccall's magazine for her review over sound of music panning it um yeah. she was born in, she was born in california she started out running revival cinemas in the 50s and writing notes for that then she was on the radio and then she started uh, publishing p pieces uh, back east, which got her onto the New York publication circuit. Uh, she, I want to say she went to McCall's New Republic and then ended up around the late 60s, early 70s at the New Yorker. Um, but she, before then, she had notable reviews of like Bonnie and Clyde. She was credited her piece as in as much as you can credit one single piece for being the thing that revitalized that movie so it turned it from a flop to a hit but then she stayed at the new yorker writing uh, off and on through the years and she picked a lot of favorite directors but also people like me who fondly think of her think of her as a voice of the 70s and a champion of a lot of the directors who made american 70s filmmaking great and she she you know her review per your point of her being uh, weirdly petty or hypercritical one of the things i've always found over the years is when she let up off of it like she could be almost embarrassingly simplistic and but genuine and infectious on why she liked the movie though like one of her reviews that didn't save the movie but as we'll remember is her mccabe and mrs miller review and today that still des it describes the movie very well especially a movie that is aged very well she she compared the premiere of uh, Last Tango in Paris to uh, Stravinsky, and she famously <laughs> reviewed. Wow. Yeah, and she reviewed Nashville a few weeks before it came out when there was worries that the studios was going to bury it. And then in the late seventies, uh, according to Easy Rider Peter Biskin's Eater Riser, Easy Rider Raging Bulls, she quit and took up Warren Beatty's offer to go to Hollywood, and Beatty made the condition. Mm -hmm that she not write about what she 
sees if she went mm. she worked on she didn't work on much she wasn't utilized most notably she worked on a james toback movie and then when she came back she went to the new yorker and wrote the other arguably pre- her best piece oh. of work <laughs> that is much remembered is called why are the movies so bad which is still pretty accurate about what was happening with the corporations buying up the studios <laughs> She had a pretty big influence. A lot of people copycatted her style a lot. Um, right. So, some of them might have been a little more structured in their copycatting <laughs> and coherent. Um, most notably, I heard recently Quentin Tarantino say that Pauline Kale's way of describing a movie is the biggest influence on him more than any other, by far more than any other filmmaker, bigger than Sergio Leone, bigger than Hawks, bigger than Godard. And, that, and that's an interesting comment. And, in you know, you try to wrap your head around it. Maybe it has something to do with, uh, like I mentioned, her passion that comes through in a lot of her reviews. And you think about Quentin Tarantino talking about film and that same uh, sort of uh, passion comes out where he, you know, just wants to, you know, get all his ideas out and <laughs> has there's, to express this on you. There's definitely, the, the coolest thing about Kale also is that she's a great exemplar of uh, movies being both high and low. Like she in the early 60s, when art art cinema really started taking over, she could be taken with it very well. She was a huge advocate of Godard. And at the same time, Antonioni, she just shit on like thoroughly. And um, she just like, or last year at Marion Bat, I remember she, and, she, and she, at the same time, she engages with these movies too. She tries to understand how they're working on an artistic level. And sometimes she would go off the deep end talking less about the movie and the type of person she knows who would say they like that movie, which in itself could be very entertaining, entertaining to read. Yeah, and what I was uh, looking at some of her other uh, pieces, and she definitely had, I think, kind of strong opinions that, you know, the things that were uh, the sort of lowbrow things that she liked, she would champion those. But if it was something that she personally didn't like, then it was trash. (laughs) And the same with the highbrow. And one thing that she really didn't seem to like was anything that was sort of a quote unquote family oriented <laughs> like sound of music uh yeah she she hated the sound of music and she didn't just like not like the movie but she sort of was railing against you know the fact that you know it's just force feeding you emotions and you know what you're supposed to feel and so if and kind of implying that if you so then if you do feel something watching it then you know you've just been basically manipulated and you can't be having a true feeling (laughs) yeah it's weird how she's such uh for me such a literary presence and at the same time she's you read some of this stuff i know so you you have one book kiss kiss bang bang right that was the one you were reading up um so i one of the things I liked, I did it early at the beginning of the pandemic, was I reread some of her reviews from the 70s, being such a mm-hmm. celebrant of the 70s and willing to forget the terrible movies that came from the 70s just because I wasn't living week to week with it. And you'd see, <laughs> right. you'd read a review of hers when she was doing week to week and be like, Godfather and Clute came out close to each other or something like that. And you'd feel like what it was like reading at the time. But at the same time, I know the... Um, the first book I read of hers was, uh, or didn't read all of it, but she has a compendium that came out in the late nineties after early nineties, after she retired called four keeps. That was at my library and you'd mm-hmm. read it. And I just didn't know the weekly context and it confused me, right. especially, especially when like you get this sense of like, you'd hear movies like El Topo and you'd be like, Oh, was this, a th- were people talking about this at water coolers <laughs> in the seventies? Right. Yeah, and that can be a little bit of a barrier when uh, you're reading. And I think it kind of depends on the piece. But yeah, she's definitely writing from the point of view of the culture that she's a part of. And so me reading it now 40 years later, I, you know, it's just not uh, resonating necessarily the same way. Mm. Do you I mean, but do you get a sense like a time capsule sense of it at all? 
Um, I think sometimes, and then sometimes, like you say, there's a maybe a reference of something that's, you know, in the culture that people are talking about. And I'm just like, well, I don't really know what I'm supposed to think about that, you know, mm-hmm. whether, you know, whether that's supposed to be something that people would be recognizing or people would be like, um, you know, that's a really... Uh, strange reference you know I just don't know <laughs> well it's it's funny like, like how, <laughs> yeah well it's also like I came out at a place of reverence and like I knew like I'd heard she was the everyone's mm-hmm. favorite film critic and I'm supposed to love this and that definitely has got to be an influence on why I went into her the way I did but I do want to point out though that she represents the time bubble of this kind of bubbled New York scene two where she, she i think she's falsely attributed this quote because um uh but what one of those conservative books talking about how bubble liberal minds are <laughs> gave her attribute her the quote after nixon won in a landslide she said i don't understand how nixon could have won no one i know voted for him right and that is um a incorrect quote and i actually uh, saw what she actually did say at the time was that uh, something like, I only know one person that voted for for him, but I don't know who these people are that voted for him. Although sometimes when I'm sitting in the theater, I can feel mm. that, you know, they're there, which is interesting because it almost makes a, uh, and she's acknowledging that she's in the bubble in a mm. way, you know, she, yeah. she, so, um, you know, give her some credit there. But yes, yeah, she's definitely she's definitely living in the bubble. The and... misquoting, at least, <laughs> like yeah. Um, the so we're um, I, I got to wedge in this joke I've had for years because <laughs> like I don't know where else I'm going to use it. Like where else are we going to have a recorded Pauline Kale conversation? But Kale has overtly sexual titles for her books. Like I lost yeah. at the movies, kiss, kiss, bang, bang, reeling when the lights go down. And my joke is that eventually she kept writing titles. Eventually in modern times in the current publishing New York circles, her book would be called I fucked a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's definitely, definitely heading that way. <laughs> yeah. It, I, she, around the time of the book state of the art, she kind of, in the last three books, I think she got off of it, but like, it's funny that for someone who everyone wanted to criticize, no one parodied that. And it's just, <laughs> this is, this is, this is mine. Let me have it. Um, <laughs> so, well, let's get into the essay, which, okay. This, this essay is mired and forgotten by the controversy around it because, and it's part of the reason I felt like this is a good idea to talk about this essay because it's the the great things in this essay are forgotten because of the very sloppy research and the, the logical fallacies and just bad thesis that this essay is under, which we should just get out of the way that the idea behind this essay is that Orson Welles did not write Citizen Kane. Herman J. Mankiewicz did. And she, her research went to mainly uh, Mankiewicz's secretary and John Hausman, who at the time, and actually from pretty much since the 40s after, had a very contentious relationship with Wells. They were fighting even when they were still working together. And I think at one point, Wells said some salacious crap about a houseman making a pass at him and being in love with them. And that was the source of all of it. The trouble, the trouble with this essay is Kale is such a, her talents is, is a gossip and uh, beyond being an amazing writer, but as a journalist, is, is she, she like, that's what's fun about this essay. And she's arguing against someone. I was rereading my lunches with Orson, the Peter Biskin, Henry Jaglon book hmm. before we recorded. And just Wells, the stories you have to take with a grain of salt too, sure. because Sure. He just he's just telling people <laughs> what they want to hear. And if you want to get at why the rebuttals of what, what's wrong with this essay, it you really don't need to go much farther than Peter Bogdanovich's rebuttal, which was published just a few months later called The Kane Mutiny, where he then goes back to Wells's secretary. And then a few years later, there's also Robert L. Carringer's Making a Citizen Kane, who he went over the drafts and showed that the basic argument Kale made was that maybe Wells 
called Mankiewicz when they were writing the script, but it gives them like sight, like a backhanded compliment of bringing the script down, which for lovers of like me of Citizen Kane, like how that movie is economizes its content is the storytelling. What makes it amazing? Like, I, well, let me, let me ask you, what do you, how, how is Citizen Kane for you? How do you feel about Citizen Kane? So I, I like Citizen Kane. Um, it's not controversial, uh, controversial. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Hot take. <laughs> Hold on to your seats, everybody. I Film like Twitter's Citizen going Kane. crazy. <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, it's, called the best movie of all time and i think it definitely deserves to be in the conversation uh, Lonnie, i don't know if you heard uh, this but vertigo is the best movie of all time oh okay that i will argue vertigo with not not <laughs> even my fourth favorite hitchcock movie of the 50s is now better than citizen kane but sorry yeah, yeah no i'm ahead. sorry i can't agree with that one but um yeah i think citizen kane is great and it is definitely a movie that uh rewards uh multiple viewings and i you've seen it more than i have but it's but yeah. it's uh, uh i i should <laughs> i should point out here that um citizen kane is up there with probably like 2001 some of the star wars movies and my kid movies like uh police academy three and four and teenage mutant ninja turtles one and two of movies i've seen a hundred times like when i was the a pantheon kid I, of greats right yeah there. the greats you know i i had I had th uh, Police Academy 3 and 4, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 and 2, Return of the Jedi. I'd seen them so many times I had them memorized. I don't know if you had any movies when you were young. You wore out the VHS on those. Yeah, I mean, you know, Forgotten Classic Care Bears 2. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably up there. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think... Carry uh, me sharing. I think I saw Return of the Jedi more time. I mean, I'd seen it a million times before I'd ever even seen Star Wars. <laughs> I had this problem where <laughs> we, we tape them off uh, USA and NBC. And I think I talked about this on an earlier episode. We I got the time wrong on the remember the VCR timers. I got the time mm -hmm. wrong on Empire. So all I I didn't have anything before. Basically, Han says, uh, well, I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. Uh, uh, Chewie, take the professor back and plug him into the hyperdrive, which is about halfway through the asteroid <laughs> sequence. So halfway through the movie, I only saw the end. I never saw the beginning for years. Um, yeah, but back to Citizen Kane. Um, back to Citizen Kane. <laughs> uh, it was interesting when I was trying to think of when was the first time I saw Citizen Kane, it would have been. Um, when AFI actually published its list in about 97 of the, you know, great 100 greatest movies of all time. And then it was playing on, they started playing some of those movies on TNT and on cable. And so mm. uh, I actually, until that point, had never seen Citizen Kane, although I think I had read the screenplay right around the same time because I came across a book that was like 10 great screenplays. So Wait, how is the screenplay? It's a very nonlinear screenplay, and nonlinear screenplays are in right. particular hard to read. And plus, the format, like '40s format, I tried it a few years ago reading mm -hmm. some Preston Sturges screenplays, and they, the old format was it's just way more and unreadable. Like, in fact, one of the modern versions of the format, the father supposedly of the readable screenplay, was Casablanca, which is co-written by Howard Hawk, who was the co-writer of the War of the Worlds uh, uh, radio play. And there is some issue in Kane Mutiny about, well, excuse me, not Kane Mutiny. There was some issue about him not getting credit for that, but it's also when he was on staff for Wells' show, he was the equivalent of a talk show host writer. So, and it was still <laughs> Wells' idea, but. Hmm. It might've been edited for the, for the book to be more uniform um, because it had screenplays from yeah the 30s 40s into the sting in the 70s mm. um, so it had a variety but um, I, you know I enjoyed reading the screenplay and and then I was when I was watching the movie I kind of had it there in front of me as I was so kind of like you had watching along and um, it was interesting in this version anyways I don't know what version they were using but uh, some of the things were it is nonlinear, but they were also in a different order in the screenplay. And but, I, like what? I, think, I think one of the main things I remember is that uh, in the movie, when uh, the reporter starts going to talk to Kane's um, 
family and friends, he first goes to visit his uh, second wife and she just kind of grumbles at him and he leaves. And mm. I believe in the screenplay that that didn't, that yeah. wasn't in there. And so it just started out with him going to uh, the Thatcher library or something like that. Um, which well, there, there, there's a sequence though. where he goes to the, oh wait, is there like a boarded attempt to go to the uh, Dorothy Commodore character? Yeah, he goes to visit her and you get that first mm. um, shot going through the sign of her nightclub, the yeah. famous uh, shot. And then he, she just kind of is crying and wants to drink and he can't get anything out of her. So he leaves and then goes on and talks to a few people, then goes back later. And you know, <laughs> you know, one funny observation Kale had that uh, I read and I, I just clicked this time. I hadn't read it before. And it, it's, it's going to make, it's going to haunt the way I see Citizen Kane forever is he's a newsreel reporter, but he goes oh, wow. like, a, he goes like a newspaper reporter by himself and doesn't bring a cameraman with him. Yeah. So like, it, it's, yeah. Um, so Kale, um, I guess should we go ahead into okay kale research she flat out said was selective she had this problem where it's, it's very clear she had a thesis and she conformed she did a lot of research unfortunately she used a, a, a someone who was on the staff at ucla when she was she was a guest lecturer there was a guy named howard super at ucla who had either taught a class on Citizen Kane or done a lot of research. And there was this, um, Bogdanovich found this out in Kane Mutiny and published it, that talk to him about co-writing this introduction and using his research. And she made, she worked a year on this and made like 700 bucks on the whole writing of it. And she sent a check off to him for half that money, got his essay, and then never credited it with it, which... It's kind of ironic when she's writing <laughs> writing an essay about um, someone taking lauded credit for half stealing the writing of, of a, a forgotten writer. But but Kale like flat out is quoted as saying she didn't talk to Orson Welles and she's quoted as saying, I felt there was nothing to talk to him about. I know what he has to say. So she didn't talk to Joseph Bankowitz, Bernard Herrmann. She did stories from uh Nunelli Johnson and half the story and then not follow up on it. And so the I think I've seen people on the internet describe this essay as discredited, which I don't think is too unfair of a characterization on the fact-based stuff. I think maybe in the respect of her point seems to be that Herman Mankiewicz deserves more credit for writing Citizen Kane and Orson Welles doesn't deserve to be on that uh, credit card uh, that says you know, <laughs> screenplay by. That yeah. seems to be the main point yeah. as far as the Mankiewicz stuff. Um, which, which, yeah, I think I think you're you're right in saying when you bring in this other evidence here, that's uh, you know Bogdanovich and bringing in the. Um, older drafts that Wells had, and you can see there was definitely collaboration. As a film editor, I, I, I had this uh, discussion a few episodes back with Jonathan Rosenbaum when we were talking about Other Side of the Wind, and I was trying to ask him about because I'd heard they'd had a long assembly, and every movie I've worked on has a long assembly, and the art of editing, the thing that I always tell people it doesn't take more than like a week or two to edit a movie. It takes like six months to bring it down to like economically tell it. And when you cut stuff out, when you make, bring these points together, when you figure out the flow, you're bringing down the assembly. That's at least how I've edited movies. And the first draft of the script was called American and Kale has it as being like 300 something pages. I found it online and I saw it was like 260 or something. And I didn't get too far into it. I read the opening, but the, Mo Susan Kane opens very iconic, I think it's like five or six shots of San Simeon, uh, Kane's mansion that's been largely abandoned. And there's this really cool motif Wells has where the light is at the exact same spot on the screen as he dissolves between these images. But there's only like five exterior shots to show you how grand this mansion is. In 
Mankiewicz's first draft, which it's a first draft, to be fair, it's a first draft. Mm-hmm. It's two pages of like 12 different scenes describing zoos and abandoned golf courses. And to not talk about how this movie's cut down, like, I mean, th- there's this thing called the elliptical cut that is what I live off of. And the greatest example of this is in that sequence when Kane's growing <laughs> up. And yeah. Yeah, where he's like, you know, where uh, he's like, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And there's a cut before the Happy New Year and nine years pass. It's that concept of end of scene. Like the... two decades. But... <laughs> yeah. End of scene with a question, answer it in the next scene. Or or just like the fun comedy of like the the sequence with the uh, dis- dis- dissolving of Kane's first marriage over the breakfast mm-hmm. table. Mm-hmm. Which is such a cool, and I, I heard, I read Wells say he ripped it off of something. So it's not like Wells is okay with like, you know, he, he's still amenable to take, you know, st- you know, right, d- right. good, good, uh, good creators don't, um, you know, homage, they steal, you know. Yeah. But it's just, even in the essay, there's just tenuous logic, which I don't know, I'm beating this drum when I have, we're over a half hour in and I still haven't gotten to like the glories of this essay. Why I wanted to talk about this essay. Why I think this essay is yeah. a sad, yeah. Um, well, let's, well, let's just agree that, um, you know, the, her point about the Mankiewicz Wells relationship and the writing credit has been debunked, let's say, yeah. discredited, but you know, the, a lot of her essay is she's talking about 1930s film and these writers, and I think trying to sort of um, champion these writers, Mankiewicz among them. Yeah, and I mean, that, that, that part is, uh, you know, interesting. That, sure. this, come, this comes to the reason I wanted to uh, talk to you specifically about it, because among, among my friends, you're the ones that loves 30s film the most. Although I will point out, I met, I've mentioned this to you before, our old for AFS friend, Julie Peterson, I want to say was writing something in college on screwball comedies. And I remember mm-hmm. she she glo- uh, um, grokked on to the exact reason I love this essay on her uh, to, uh, for herself, which is that this essay is an amazing histor- historical analysis of the literary talent that went into the thirties with, which is arguably the most literary and witty period in American film and defined the early spirit of the talkies more than anything else. She's, she goes on to this idea of that the Algonquin round table, all these early um, newspaper and playwright people from New York came over to the West coast instead of going like expatriates of nobility and novel writing to Paris because they were money grubbing and a little drunk and yeah. <laughs> they were they were used to this idea of I don't know daily wit or like they were just like they were they all got going round table spirit where they were just very funny and witty and they put all this ta- the writers on on the list that she mentions there's there's Mankiewicz there's Ben Hank Ben Hecht Charles MacArthur George S Kaufman who actually co-wrote a play with Mankiewicz and is the editor real life basis behind the scene in Kane where mm-hmm. um. Jebediah gets drunk and can't finish the review. Uh, Mark <laughs> Connolly, Nathaniel West, S.J. Perlman, Preston Sturges, who, I mean, do you have fond feelings about Preston Sturges like I do? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, uh, kind of a, one of the masters of comedy. You know, yeah. Film comedy. Um, John O'Hara, Donald Ogden Stewart, who was a big um, Hitchcock screenwriter, I believe. Samson Raphaelson, Dorothy Parker. Um one of my favorite movies I watched from this is the um, uh, what, what, what's uh, Altman's uh, protege, Alan Rudolph. Alan Rudolph's movie, Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, with uh, mm-hmm. Jennifer Jason Lee playing Dorothy Parker is great, <laughs> and uh, Ninelli Johnson. And these people aren't remembered just because everyone was script doctoring each other. And in Hollywood, which we'll get to credit is this nebulous beast. And the writer is always the lowest on the totem pole. And unfortunately they started the tradition of writer being the most ignored and therefore credit goes all over the place and people would rewrite each other over and over. And no one was the sole author of anything, but, but at the same time, the comedy, the like intelligence, like, this, this to me, I, 
we, I don't know if I, I, I think I was already a hyperactive, enthusiastic talker <laughs> before reading this essay, but this like gave me this telescope down of like, this is a period of movie to watch just because <laughs> these people talk fast. I talk fast. I want to talk funny fast. And like these, just, there's just this giant great list of movies and enthusiasm and spirit behind this essay that's been forgotten because of the bad reporting. Yeah, and uh, I, I, it's interesting when you look at just like IMDb or something, when if you try to look up one of these writers and look at their credits, you'll see a lot of movies listed, but most of them will say uncredited. So um, I, guess, <laughs> I guess we have to uh, kind of assume like Kale is asserting here that these people were collaborating and just sort of showing each other scripts and sharing things and maybe throwing a line here or there. And so their influence is kind of crossing over between scripts. But if you just look at like Herman Mankiewicz's uh, actual credits where he's listed as the author, there are far fewer films. And, and, uh, yeah. and, it's, inter and it's an interesting mix, too, when yeah. you look at what some of these people are actually credited as. Well, even like the movies she gives credit to are things like the the big ones are things like the Marx Brothers movies, like Monkey Business and yeah. Horse Feathers, which he was only a producer on. Like right. he's not credited as a he's not writer. Listed as a writer, he yeah. supposedly added something to Duck Soup too. Yeah, and I noticed. Um, I I've noticed. I think Mankiewicz and uh, Ben Hecht being named on several Hitchcock pictures too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes credited or uncredited. I, I I knew Hecht was. I don't know if Mankiewicz was. What what uh, kind of? Maybe. Well, I might I might be misremembering, but mm. it would have been kind of uncredited. <laughs> I had a few lists on uh, movies that I picked out. I know million. She says one of her favorite movies, Million Dollar Legs. And I've never seen that, and that's definitely on the list. But she mentions at the end, uh, old pick of years for movie club, uh, yeah. mid Midnight with uh, Don Amici. Yeah, yeah, which I, you know, I love that, the wit of that movie. Yeah, she also, I know it took me years to find these movies, and I ended up watching, I know one of them was on TCM, but an early Preston Sturges written movie, Power and the Glory, which was supposedly a nonlinear movie about a media mogul from 1933 that she says was a big influence on Kane's writing from Mankiewicz's standpoint. And she also mentions Mad Love, which Greg mm -hmm. Tolan was, um, it's got Peter Laurie in it from 1935. And Greg Tolan, see, there's some stills in the book and you can see it and you're like, oh, that makes sense. And that's one of the movies that Bogdanovich in Kane Mutiny tears apart. And, and oh, to be fair, really? Bogdanovich goes to town on the logic uh, Kale has for how filmmaking works and you know and to be fair critics often will like you know have some not great conceptions of filmmaking but she talks about or he talks about Kale surmising that the director of photography would influence the co-writer or writer producer director stars perform performance <laughs> based on some movie he did seven years ago that he was the second cameraman on and but yeah the still i mean trying to compare trying to make the comparison with peter laurie was a bit uh stretched but i think she was also saying that the expressionist uh, uh look of mad love may have in, been influenced on citizen kane through toland which yeah well it was. and in specific, <laughs> in specific well I know Bogdanovich and others comment that there was already German expressionism in Wells's uh, theatrical work, but like, and but she also goes to town on Wells' obsession with Stagecoach, which he said he watched forty times. And there's this great line Bogdanovich writes where you know he points out Kale was skeptical about the forty times, and she's like, "Can you not take anything he says mm -hmm. at face value?" And pointing out that John Ford right. didn't have much <laughs> German expressionism in his work, although. I recently uh, saw the movie that well, um, uh, Ford won, or was nominated for his first Oscar, The Informer, mm -hmm. which is very the German Informer. expressionistic. It's yeah. oh, it's so good. It, there's so much great German expressionism in that. But um, I mean, so much with the greatness of this essay comes that one of the thesis I have on the show is that our the big movies we 
all love is the movies that got us when our brain was soft when we were in our teenage years. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. And th- she writes a lot about the wit that went into the late talkies and early, early sound movies. And it's clear that these are the movies she herself watched when she was in her teens going into her twenties. And it's clear that the newspaper comedies that took place predominantly in New York were a big influence on like not only how she wrote but how she clearly ending up in new york wanted to live her life and so she has a long list of it happened one night to his girl friday and points out that this is the apotheosis of the newspaper comedy and susan kane is and my argument is that there's so much joy and infectiousness and exploration of 30s movies You're, you're going to find some great movies you hadn't heard of reading this essay And Kale's going to really sell them. To your earlier point, this isn't her being critical of a lot of these things, for the most part, would you say? Or I guess she's she's inevitably going to be somewhat critical on some of these movies she's deciding a little. Yeah, the thing, one of the things about Kale is she can't, she almost can't help herself, even when she's um, praising something, she can't help but cut down something or point out something that she thinks is wrong about it yeah <laughs> like she can't uh, she wants everyone to know that nothing has escaped her notice and so i'm gonna just mention this little thing that really is inconsequential but uh, <sighs> just so you don't think that i'm totally praising you <laughs> it's funny how i guess there's just so much uh m- someone like me is being so deferential to her about that and or <laughs> or so in awe of like well, Ye- yes, well, you are right. Like this, this goes to the, her circle of Paulettes. Like I would have eagerly been a Paulette. Well, and that uh, you know that uh, tendency that I just brought up is something that I've seen other people praise in her. That you know she's you know she's not going to just give you an unqualified rave. She is going to point out the things. But I think sometimes it gets into some pretty nitpicky territory. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess there's just been hypercritical critics before and like you tend to forget the things they hate. Like when people talk about Kale, they talk about the movie she flipped out over. Like I think I sent you the quote he had from his um she was a she was a big Brian De Palma fanatic and her mm-hmm. quote from Casualty of War is calling it one of the most emotional five or six most emotional movies ever made. And like yeah. I, I well, like actually wars fine, but like when I rewatch yeah. it, I, I, do, I wish I, I wish I saw it the way she saw it. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess just to give you an example of what I'm talking about in her um, essay on Bonnie and Clyde, she is saying it's important work, but then is picking on so many aspects of the direction and the acting and the writing. And then she even says that the editing is the best in an American movie uh, in a very long time, but then right after that said, but there is this one instance though mm-hmm. where it's very badly edited, <laughs> and you just and talks about you know some cut where the person's mouth doesn't match what you hear, and I'm thinking, really, did you really have to bring that up? <laughs> there's a there's a passage in the book of past guest Paul Hirsch where he said he met her and he called her out it's like what because she had a throwaway line about the editing star wars which he was mm. the finishing editor on and she says she used a line like grab bag editing or, or crash boom editing or something like that and he said something along he called her out he's like another movie that goes what would what, what worked on this movie that didn't work on star wars and she did not give an inch she's i think she even <laughs> repeated the line There's a blogger I know, a past guest host, Ted Haycraft, is a big fan of, and I like, Dennis Cozzello, who wrote um, The Art of the In-Flight, Sergio Leone and The Art of the In-Flight Rule. And on the masthead of his blog is a Kale quote that is something I know, like I watch movies by, but the quote is, great movies are rarely perfect movies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. There's probably no perfect movie. I think just if you're writing an essay about something it's making having the discipline to not necessarily mention everything every imperfection that you notice Mm -hmm. and you know does it really help your point does it really further 
you know, your message to bring up everything. I, I know when to- I've written reviews about things, I, my, I could have a whole list of like, well, I didn't like this and I didn't like this, but then I have to just decide. I'm not actually going to mention that yeah. because I don't know that it's important. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're talking to an editor who has to work often a <laughs> month at a time. And especially when you start out on the journey, you know, it's been frequently commented that an editor is half psychologist and we have to be kind of cheerleader half the time. So we have to be, I found in the past, a lot of times movies turn the corner when you stop pointing out what's not working and just, just fixate on what is. Um, so uh, I did want to mention one thing that's uh, recently you, you said you haven't seen the new Charlie Kaufman movie. I'm thinking of ending things. I haven't seen that. Yeah. I, I, I have been, it's on Netflix. Now. I have been thinking a lot about that movie, but I did want to mention that there's this, mm-hmm. it's very Brechtian formalist meta, you know, and in dialogue suddenly changes topics with characters suddenly spouting something random out of nowhere. And there's an early scene where um, they, they pass over uh, Kale's book for keeps real briefly in the childhood bedroom of Jesse, the character Jesse Plemons plays. And then later in the movie, um, Jesse Buckley starts randomly reciting from Kale's review of John Cassavetes, a woman under the influence. And it's a great observation on I don't know. Maybe it's more to your point of like, because she's being critical, but she's talking about how the performance affects us. But I think she's also talking about how it doesn't work. But even just as a piece of writing, it's captivating to watch. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, we're talking a scene in a car and a snowstorm that could be shot on a soundstage with two actors who we've been watching for a long period of time. And suddenly one actor just reciting a Kale review is pretty damn captivating. It's, and it's, it's and we're talking a almost 20 35 year old review it's mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's it's just a point of how her writing still still lasts so um do we want to i, I do want to the 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 controversy the unfortunate reason this movie is or this essay is forgotten i want to get into is the backlash just because mm. we've got we've sufficiently gone over the backlash, even though I have a full note yellow legal pad of all the stuff that all these precious notes that I have to get across. But <laughs> but this essay was published when Wells was finishing. He was notorious for having a bunch of movies that were unfinished. He needed a few shots because he was shooting these things grab bag, and at the time when this essay came out, Wells only was like you going to bed, only read the first half of it, never read (laughs) the second half. But he was making the movie that just came out recently that just finally got finished years after his death, The Other Side Mm -hmm. of the Wind. And there's a character in there played by Susan Strasberg, uh, daughter of Lee, who's based on Kale. And the problem at the time was that I think a lot of uh, Wells defenders, who I consider myself a part of, are mad at all the movies that he didn't get to make and didn't want any negative press against him as attributing the idea that he still couldn't make something good. And I think one of the reasons this essay deserves a little bit more light of day right now is other side of the wind came out. Wells is dead. He's not going to make any more movies. Like we can relook at this as a, such a great example of, of celebration of 30s filmmaking and also one thing over the years when i've reread this essay i always read the beginning so and the beginning mm-hmm. is where most of the 30s historical contents in mm-hmm. right. Yeah. right like like it was funny like i think the first time i read this essay it completely passed over my head that she was saying that wells didn't write citizen kane i don't know if that was just because i thought the logic was so specious or but there's there's just so much in this essay that I don't know, I just, I, I mean, I think this essay deserves to be reread and, and maybe with the foreknowledge that it's in two parts and it might take you two nights reading before you go to bed. <laughs> I mean, I think there are, like I said before, I think there are things to pull out that are good points. And, um, but you know, she kind of goes back and forth on a lot of things, uh, and kind of comes circles around to things. And so 
you know, she is trying to say that Kane is an example of collaboration. And um, that is, yes, that is true. <laughs> it's a great example of collaboration. And now, um, I know one you know, easy argument against that is the title cards. Like the Wells shares the first card with Greg Tolan. And Mankiewicz supposedly went to the Screenwriters Guild about this and was going to arbitrate, but didn't. But then when they came back to it, Wells gave Mankiewicz front billing o over him. So. Right, yeah. In the credits, it says, you know, the screenplay by, and you have Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles there. It was Mankiewicz, then, Mankiewicz and Welles, you know, screen, they won the Oscar for it. Yeah, and uh, uh, Roger Ebert, uh, in his essay on uh, Citizen Kane, called the example of um, Welles' directing credit is on the same card as the credit for Greg Toland as the cinematographer. And he called that uh, an example of genuine modesty, giving mm -hmm. Toland that uh, credit there, sharing the card. But then the way that Wells is credited in the cast as the last person credited and it's false. Kane. <laughs> yeah, that is false modesty. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could talk, I could go into all of the, the kind of the weird persona surrounding Orson Welles and this movie. Um, but I think if we're, we're talking about, you know, if this is worth reading because of Kale, I, I think she does make a lot of interesting points. And there are some wonderful quotes, you know, uh, like about the collaboration. If a movie is good, there's a tendency to believe that everything was conceived and worked out beautifully to a master plan. Mm. And I think, you know, you as a being behind the scenes on films can probably attest that usually that's not the case. Well, <laughs> there's, there, there's also this funny or, point. I, or make I guess up. she's kind of coming against the auteur theory there too. Yeah. Like, Cause yeah. she, she was at a, like famously her big salvo in the film world was when the Cahe du cinema came out with the auteur theory. It was brought into New York by Andrew Saris, and she wrote a famous essay called Circles and Squares that contradicted that. And then she ends up, all the people who love and hate her both try to ask her, so how do you feel about auteurs? I mean, you like directors. And there's, and it's weird because she, she fell in love with certain directors. She was she, like De Palma. She was a, uh, um, she was a apologist almost to a certain extent, which, to be fair, I also am a De Palma apologist, <laughs> um, but she liked every Altman movie, which especially Altman, when you get yeah. when you get into the '80s, it's it's you, you know only a mother can love some of those movies, and like, <laughs> and then Jonathan Demme, but like the one quote I have from her on director that I I, I felt strongly with was the director should be in control not because he's the sole creative intelligence, but because only if he's in control can he liberate and utilize the talent of his coworkers, and I can't. I've been looking forever to find this Orson Welles quote. I, I think I thought it was in Joseph McBride's great book, whatever happened to Orson Welles, but it's basically early in the eighties. Welles himself said a director implied that a director isn't the creative intelligence or the thing that makes things from whole cloth that he said at the end of the day, all they're doing is their taste and they're choosing one thing to choose or ignore. So. Yeah. It, it's funny reading this now and, trying to get into what kind of spurred Pauline Kell to write this and try and kind of take down the, uh, you know, the credit of Orson Welles. And it's almost like she just got some bee in her bonnet about Orson Welles at some point, <laughs> in, you know, 1970 and just was like, I'm tired of hearing this guy. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, you know, write something against him because you know, she has she praised his movies before, and and these quotes that we're putting out there, it's not as if they disagree. I think Orson Welles was always very uh, open about collaborating with people and always trying to elevate his, uh, you know, the people that are making the movies with him and giving them credit. Now, whether you think it's false modesty or genuine modesty, I don't think that they were at odds, but. She, but you, maybe it's just his public persona at that point people were all trying to make him into the mastermind of citizen kane and 
he was kind of just going along with it. And I, I got a rando <laughs> question for you. How do you feel about um, the Chaplin movie, Monsieur Verdot? Um, I like it. You do? I don't, I don't think I have strong feelings about it, but I, I've seen it. And okay. I, you, I liked it. <laughs> you know it's a collaboration between Chaplin and Orson Welles, right? Um, no, I, didn't, I don't think I knew about uh, Welles' involvement in that. I think Chaplin took the screenplay and completely rewrote it, but I and I think Wells's name is still on it. But mm. um, yeah, no, he he Wells was always a great collaborator, editor. There's just there's very few examples, unfortunately, of him having all the studio resources to work with. And mm. Kane was one of them. Touch of Evil was almost one of them. But the rest of them, he just went away, which is another reason the Joseph McBride book is really good. It's a great illustrator of it um one point i do want to make about the uh kale's arguments against uh wells not being involved with the script is that there's this logical fallacy she keeps going down where she points out whenever something autobiographical about wells is mentioned mm -hmm. it's minkwitz teasing wells yeah <laughs> and like there's there's crazy things like bernstein the guy that takes kane's uh orphaned kane is the name of Wells is real caretaker who, and I was reading in that uh, Harry Jaglon book, Wells, whether he's, you know, saying this is an aside or not, says this is, might be his real dad. And, but Hey, Herman Mankiewicz came up with that first. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting when you um, like reading things like that and you kind of wonder well, would people at the time have picked up on this or was this just kind of an inside thing between the the writer, you know, the filmmakers, like they would know that, but I don't know that any viewer would know that. Um, you did, you did, know. you watched uh, and prep for this, the, uh, I forget who directed it, but I think Ridley Scott produced RKO 24. 281. 281. 281. Yeah. <laughs> RKO 281. Yeah. THX 1138. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That movie uh, was uh, covering the period of making uh, Susan Kane and really was focusing more on the um, backlash from Hearst and his pressure on the studio heads at the time, not even just the RKO studio, but people like Louis V. Mayer, other um, studio heads to not uh, let the movie see the light of day mm. um, and yeah I mean I, this is one of those things where it's like a cultural disconnect like you know this as Raising Cain was written in 71 1970 which is 30 years after uh, Citizen Kane actually came out um, but clearly Hearst was a figure that just loomed incredibly large in the culture and for Pauline Kael was someone that she obviously knew a lot about and either just through him being part of the culture or she was interested in him. Um, and that Bonnie and Clyde review I read, she mentions not only Hearst, but also San Simeon just as these tossed off cultural references. So it's obviously something that was very much um, in her mind. And as some contemporary viewer watching it, you know, was probably watching that and thinking, oh yeah, this is, this is you know very much uh, obviously based on Hearst, and maybe thirty years later in seventy one, people are still alive who would have that same impression, even though Hearst died in the fifties. But you know nowadays, I have no idea what it would have been like. What you know, I think people nowadays know R William Randolph Hearst as the uh inspiration for citizen kane <laughs> that's, that's true I, I do remember when i first saw this movie that i did i recognized from my public education the uh uh you provide the pictures i'll provide the war quote that one i knew about but beyond that not yeah i, I think his, his power definitely there's there's the great passage uh late in the essay where she describes being in san francisco dancing with a date right. and, and running <laughs> Oh, it's crazy. Her description of how like ta tall and, and like powerful and towering he was like and scary. And she's like, yeah. and being someone who's so well read, she she talks about she'd read two biographies on him, including right. 
one that I forget the name of the title, but later they she talks about this later in the essay. They sued Mankin Whitson Wells for copyright infringement for using for Citizen Kane, and Mankin's got in yeah. trouble for owning like three copies of it. It's yeah. like so I think it's called Imperial Hearst. Is the book? Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah and um, yeah, so it, it, it is kind of funny when you're talking thinking about authorship. It's like how much of that was just kind of things that were in the popular consciousness, and how much was it like um, them inventing? I mean, obviously they invented the events of the movie, but it was some they, of it was very thinly veiled. Some of it was very close. And they combined. There's this Chicago guy who right. was the basis of the opera, but. I don't know, to your, to your point, I mean, Fincher's making a movie that's going to come out in a month about a movie that's now 80 years old in the making yeah. of it. And you watched one from 20 years ago about the making yeah. of the same one. So, yeah, I mean, um, did you have anything else or was that? Yeah, I mean, as far as the essay goes, um, I think there's a lot of interesting points and if you want to you know have a list of some 1930s movies to check out that's certainly a place to start um seeing the the movies that she lists and um do you at least think that she she makes you excited to watch some of them because that's how i felt or when i reread this essay um i don't know that i i don't know that i would say that here the thing i know this is just me like basically saying i don't like her but the no thing is, I, I, like, I, can, I can appreciate her writing and i see her getting excited about things but when she but a lot of the time her specific opinions about things happen to be the exact opposite of mine and so it's almost like if she really, really likes something I'll know maybe I don't like this or if she doesn't like something, I'm probably fine with it. What so, are your good, ex- what are your examples? So, um, well, she loves Bon. She loved bon- Bonnie and Clyde. She was a real champion of Bonnie and Clyde. And I don't really care for that movie. And in her um, essay about it, I remember her singling out, you know, the violence in Bonnie and Clyde is essential and I don't really have a problem with that. But then she said the violence in the dirty dozen is personally offensive to her, which mm. I don't really understand. And the dirty dozen is one of my favorite movies. Mm. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Just kind of things that she'll single out as being, uh, you know, things that she likes, you know, I just usually don't like those movies as much. So I'm, it's more like, well, she, maybe she liked that. Maybe it's worth checking out, but I'm not going to run out and and find it. <laughs> I guess maybe we're talking the deference coming back in where I I, I feel like, oh, if Pauline Kael bequeaths this movie as a, because it's just her mentioning a movie that she loves as a teenager is enough for me like, holy shit, I guess I should, should watch this. But yeah, maybe, I don't know. You, you do have a point that like, that I do, I have this feeling that she's a, she, she was better than her time when consumerist um, uh, reviewing the the newspaper reviewing consumerist idea of like should I go see this or should I not go this. She was better. She was that hybrid between academic and reviewer, the, the critic, which they talked up. I know she's frequently cited the uh, or um, the Oscar Wilde essay, the critic as artist as this higher form and i mean like that's the sad thing about this this greatness of this essay was she was she was really in love with the new journalists at the time like norman mailer and truman capote and tom wolf and she she was trying to figure out her own form maybe expand the form herself and something that combined journalism and criticism and gossip all in one and the unfortunate legacy of this essay is the bad, sloppy reporting that's made everyone and the, you know, the thesis, unfortunately. But there's just so much great. I, if I can, I want to end on some of my favorite quotes from the essay. Um, the celebrating the '30s. Um, it's the hardest headed period of American movies, G- given American talkies their character. The '20s moves west in the '30s, expatriates without leaving the country. 
These writers were too talented and too sophisticated to put a high value on what they did. In the silence, the heroes were often simpletons. In the talkies, the heroes were to be men who weren't fooled, who were smart and learned their way around. Um, and these writers, the whole group, were more interested in theater and the movies, and they and they were fast, witty writers, used to regarding their work not as deathless prose, but as stories written to the order of the market, used to the newspaper man's pretense of putting light value on what they did, the look no no hands attitude. And I don't know. I, I it, it it makes me want to go watch a movie from the thirties right now. So. Well, you know what, Shane? I did wake up this morning and feel, and I was like, I just want to put on a black and white movie <laughs> and like enjoy something funny, and uh, and yeah. So maybe maybe indirectly that that did put me in that yeah. mindset. <laughs> I want to I want to put on TCM and watch something that's pillar boxed. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess that's it for this episode of the podcast. I want to thank Lonnie again for being here. Oh, you're you're making like a, fa- a sad laugh face right now. Oh, I I just uh, I just hope that um, you know I was able to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> when you come up with uh, some other movie you want to talk about, you I'd be love to have you back on, and maybe just for to be smart about this i'm not going to force you to watch something my picks that was interesting shane air quotes (laughs) well thanks everybody for listening thanks